Go ahead. All right. Um, this is the second of a three-part series. The series is the Scottish Episcopal Roots of our Eucharistic Theology. And our speaker is Dr. Hawk Reinhardt. She has a PhD degree from, in historical theology from St. Louis University. And she serves as director, Anglican House of Studies at Eden Theological Seminary, and also as instructor in the School for Theological Formation, the Episcopal School for Ministry here in our diocese. So with this, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hawk Reinhardt. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen again. And we will see if I can get this started. Hold on, finally. So I, last time- I have a quick question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I had always assumed that uh, Bishop Seabury uh, could easily obtain uh, ordination from the Episcopal Church of in Scotland. And uh, uh, you indicated, and, and the other information I looked up indicated that he was there for a while and they apparently uh, wanted to uh, work over his theological perception. Do uh, you know anything about that? So that's uh, really more of an expertise of my colleague, Dan Hanshi. Um, my understanding is that Seabury already had his uh, son um, publish some of his letters and uh, Seabury already had a beginning of an understanding uh, that he continued with the Scots. So the Scots really didn't change his Eucharistic theology that much. So there's controversy. Some say that uh, when Seabury was ordained by the Scots that, as you said, uh, his theology had been worked over and he was to bring the Scottish Eucharistic theology over with him. But there are other scholars like Dan Hanshi who argue from um, evidence uh, that Seabury was fine with this. He was already moving in this direction and um, there really wasn't a problem, but he did worship with the Scots for a couple of years. So I think that that probably did living in that and experiencing it probably cemented his understanding of the theology. Okay, thank you. I, 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 I had thought that it was just a kind of a slam dunk uh, uh, when, he, uh, when he went up to the Scottish church, but uh, apparently not, uh, but okay. Yeah, it seems to be a little more complicated. <laughs> Okay, okay. So good question, thank you. Um, actually going back to this first screen, I wanted to start with where we were last week was we were talking about the Eucharist as a sacrifice. And part of what we have in our Eucharistic theology is that we participate in the divine life and are increasingly transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit to become the body of Christ through the Eucharist. I think that's part of the reason why we're missing it so much right now. This is different than the, um, the Protestant uh, continental reformers view that the uh, Eucharist is more of a remembering of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, not this continuing ongoing Christ presenting to the Father, the sacrifice that he made once for all, and that we're being caught up in that sacrifice. We talked about usages last time, the ritual indicators that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. I wanted to review those quickly, go a little bit more in depth before we start looking at the history of, of one particular Scottish um, bishop. So we have four usages, four ritual indicators that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. There's the mixed chalice. Here, the water represents the people. The wine, according to this bishop, represents Christ. And the mixing of the two is the union of the church with Christ. 
So the Scots are going to make an argument, and especially Thomas Ratray is going to make the argument that this needs to be done where the people can see it happening so that we know that we are being continually incorporated into, uh, into Christ and participating in this divine union. The oblationary prayer, offering ourselves. Here we see the bread and the wine as symbols of our tribute being offered to Christ. We're offering our life and our labor to the Lord of our own, of thine own, oh, excuse me, of thine own are we offering thee. God gives us grain and grapes, and through human labor, we make bread and wine. Also, the bread and the wine are symbols of Christ's body and blood offered in union with Christ's ongoing offering, and their imitation the priest is doing an imitation of Christ's offering. So what's happening at the table is that as the priest is lifting up the, the elements, this is an imitation of what Jesus is doing in heaven on our behalf. And so the priest is, is imitating Christ and we're being caught up in that imitation are in that actual. So what we're doing in imitation in our church is participating in the reality that's going on in heaven. Did that make sense or did I just muddle that up for you? It makes sense. It made sense. Thank you. The epiclesis, 50 cent word for the prayer that the priest prays over the Eucharistic elements and over us, asking the Holy Spirit to come and cause a mysterious change in the elements. This is the same Holy Spirit involved in the incarnation. The Scots are going to restore the epiclesis over the people, making us worthy to participate in this sacred mystery causing us to be incorporated into more deeply into the body of Christ. And then the prayers for the dead. This is saying something about what we understand about the church. Is the church only those people who are gathered together on Sunday morning, the living? Or is there something that's happening when we are gathered in Eucharist? that the whole company of heaven, not only the angels, but all the saints who've gone before us, are that we're being caught up into this celebration together. Oops, sorry. And so the prayers for the dead is an ancient practice. This is not something that's found in scripture. This is gonna cause problems with the, uh, the continental reformers. <laughs> But here we have Christ once for all sacrifices for the benefit of the entire church. And maybe there's something going on with those who have, have died in Christ that they're continuing to benefit from the ongoing Eucharist. So now that we have the usages in mind, let's, I want to get us into the, the history of what's going on with Thomas Ratray during this time. So going back to 1549, we have the, the first English Book of Common Prayer that has the four usages in it. Not the epiclesis over the people at least, but it has an epiclesis. Then we have 1552, Thomas Cramner has been influenced by the Continental Reformers. Well, and his argument with Bishop Gardner, uh, excuse me, Bishop Gardner, that you can end up reading the 1549 as a Eucharistic sacrifice. So he says, well, we'll fix that. So he takes out the usages. Jumping ahead, 1637, we have the Scottish Book of Common Prayer. This is also called Laud's Book. 
two of the usages are included, this causes an uproar in Scotland. The uproar leads to the Bishop's War, leads to civil war. We're having wars over prayer books and whether or not the Eucharist is a sacrifice. There's other things going on, but, but that's one of the things involved. This ends with the glorious revolution when William and Mary are brought over, they establish the uh, Presbyterian Kirk as the, as the state church of Scotland. The Scottish Episcopal Church is disestablished. The bishops and the priests who continue to serve as Episcopalians are, they lose their income. They lose their ability to minister to their, their people. Now, another issue starts happening. The Scots are making the argument that the king has the right to seat diocesan bishops. This is that, we've got that merge of church and state going on here. So by being disestablished, now we've got a problem. The king's in exile. He doesn't have jurisdiction. And now we've got we've got to do something or they've got to do something because <laughs> bishops are not. and we need apostolic succession. We need to continue doing what the apostles were doing and what the church has always done. But the king's not willing to seat the bishops in their diocese. In 1704, when the Scottish primus, who is the, 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 the primus is the equivalent of the, um, the presiding bishop for us, died when that happens he is uh the bishop of of edinburgh st andrews and they the bishops decide they're going to have a college of bishops that are going to uh govern the scottish episcopal church these are non-diocesan bishops and they don't they're non-usagers they're more along the lines of the continental reformers. So we've got two kinds of bishops. You know, we've got those who are pro-usages, the Eucharist is a sacrifice, and those who are saying, no, it's more of a memorial, a remembrance of what Christ has done. Now we've got a usages controversy that begins, it starts down with the non-jurors, uh, the English non-jurors. Thomas Ratray, the bishop I'm going to be talking about, gets involved. He's, he is a translator par excellence. They invite him down to, uh, to England as the English non-jurors decide, okay, we've, we've had enough. We're, we're not going to be able to get reestablished. We've got to find some way to connect to a historic church. Ah, what about Orthodox. Well, if we're going to talk with the Orthodox, we need someone that can translate <laughs> what we're, you know, our agreement into Greek. And they end up calling on Thomas Ratray, who's not ordained at this time, but he's been well trained in, uh, in theology. In 1724, we've got what's called the Wee Bookies being, being published and circulating, and they're being used by the Scots to restore the 1549 communion office. They're still using the 1637 Scottish Book of Common Prayer, but we don't have the other two usages. We don't have the mixing of the water and the wine. And we don't have prayers for the dead. So 1764, we have the Scottish Communion Office. We're going to be talking today mostly about what's happening between um, 1704 and, and right before 1764. So how the Scots end up with this new communion book. Here's Samuel Seabury being ordained bishop by the Scottish Episcopal, uh, Episcopal Bishops in 1784 and then our first American prayer book, which as uh, Gary has, has uh, mentioned, 
was definitely influenced by the Scottish Communion Office. And what did I just, oh, I just threw in there the instrument of union between the usagers and non-usagers. That was out of order. So thinking about what's going on, one of the things about being a historical theologian is you learn very quickly that it's all not all just about the theology. There's other stuff going on and you've got to put it in its historical context. And so the Scottish Episcopalians we're facing three crises. They've got political and economic hardships caused by being disestablished. This is, this is a forced separation between church and state for these who would not swear an oath of loyalty to William and Mary because they still have their, their loyalty is with uh, their exiled king. So we've got to figure out what do we do with we're no longer in Christendom. Church and state are no longer playing well together. What do we do? Why do we exist? How, how can they justify their existence? They've got this con controversy over ritual actions within the Eucharistic liturgy. The usage is controversy. Is the Eucharist a sacrifice or is it a memorial? And They've got this controversy over non-diocesan bishops. This is called the collegers issue. A college is a group of similar people. Are they a college if some of the bishops are diocesan bishops and some of them don't have jurisdiction? That they're not able to uh, exercise what a bishop's supposed to do? There's a king in exile. So their bishops aren't being seated. What's going to happen if we don't have if they don't have apostolic succession of their bishops? Will their church die out? Thomas Ratray's solution is to if if I don't know whether he thought this out this way or whether this is what happened, but it seems to me that by focusing on the sacrificial nature of the Eucharist and how it's transformative to us, he was able to resolve these other two issues. So let's focus on the usages controversy. I want to look at what's at stake in this argument. For those who wanted the usages, ah, we'll start with the non-usagers. For the non-usagers, they're focusing on a memorial view of the Eucharist. They're wanting to be in continuity. They're wanting to be in communion with the continental reformers. For the usagers, they're arguing for a real presence of Christ in our worship that's more real than transubstantiation. With transubstantiation, that's the view that with the, uh, the consecration of the elements and the Eucharist, that the bread becomes the body of Christ, the, the wine becomes the blood of Christ. Christ is localized in the elements. The usagers are arguing that the bread and the wine become transformative so that Christ is dwelling more deeply in the people. We're the ones being ultimately transformed. For the non-usagers, we've got the argument of, you know, what's, where, is, where does authority lie? The reforming, one of the reformers cry is that Scripture, sola scripture, scripture, only scripture has what we need for salvation. They're concerned if we if we put if we use any other text as being authoritative for our salvation, we might jeopardize our salvation. The usagers are making the argument back about well, what about anth what about questions that aren't found in scripture? We're not going to 
we're not going to say that we're not going to use scripture, but what, what the early church was doing that um, they're using the liturgy as part of their arguments in theological debates. Wait a minute, which comes first? Did the New Testament come first or did the Eucharist come first? Were the people who were writing the New Testament, were they writing it in the context of participating in the Eucharist? For the non-usagers, they want to continue the national liturgy. This is, you know, the 1662 prayer book. But the usagers want to reclaim an earlier sacramental theology from the early church that Thomas Ratray is going to argue that's been missing for over 200 years. Who do we want to be in continuity with? Do we want to continue doing what the church has always done? Is that what Catholicity means? Or is Catholicity meaning being in continuity with the, or in communion with the continental reformers? So, the non-usagers are looking to the continent. The usagers are looking to the early church and the Orthodox church. Now, they're not saying that the, the reformers are completely off the mark because when Cramner developed the 1549 prayer book, he was looking at German liturgies, Orthodox liturgies, um, as well as what was already present in the Church of England. Well, before it was the Church of England. So the Sarum liturgy, the, um, uh, the liturgy from York, from Lincoln, from the major centers of the, uh, the church as it was present before the English Reformation. So whenever you have a disruption one way of looking at it is you've got opportunities. So the disestablishment allowed liturgical freedom for the non-jurors. The established church was required by law to use the authorized prayer book. If you're not part of that church, you get to start experimenting. So we've got trade practices going on during this time. English clergy are experiencing Greek Orthodox liturgies in the Mediterranean. And they're starting to dive into research. What's going on here? How old is this? Oh, and what about that alliance with the Orthodox Church? Could that answer our question about why do we exist and how, how do we exist? Should we exist? that we're actually part of another great tradition. For a while, there's a Greek college in Oxford. Greek Orthodox priests are being trained in Oxford. And of course, now we've got the opportunity as they're practicing their liturgy and living into that, English and Scottish clergy are able to participate in those liturgies. We've got an increasing interest in the early church and availability of some text. Now, here's the question that I don't know whether they were asking, but I, it seems to me it's bubbling up. Could the Anglican middle way be more than a middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism. If we recover some of our Orthodox roots by going back to the early church, is this a three-way middle way? One of the things that um, intrigued me about Thomas Ratray and the reason I started studying him was he was an early liturgical theologian in doing comparative liturgical studies. And he pulled in one of the theologians, 
that I was had been working on, Cyril of Jerusalem, and was looking at what was the liturgical practice in the fourth, up through the fourth century. It's quite interesting. They're looking up through the fourth century. They're not, they're coming right up to the cusp of when the church and state are joined together at, at the Edict of Thessalonica. They're not making arguments from Augustine. Thomas Ratray theology is grounded in uh, Athanasius of Alexandria, specifically on the incarnation. This is a different way of looking at what the problem is for humanity. With original sin, it's, you know, we're, we're born into this sinfulness. And Athanasius makes the argument that the problem that we humans have is that our first parents, it's not that they uh, rebelled against God, as is often taught in the Western church, is we turned inward. We lost our ability to contemplate God. We wanted the knowledge of good and evil on our own rather than to share in the, in the divine life. And it was through that contemplation and communion with God, that sharing knowledge, God sharing knowledge with us and us participating in stewarding the earth, that that's how mortal flesh was participating in the immortal. But when our first parents turned their eyes away from God and turned them inward, that's when death came. Death is the consequence, not the punishment. That was just, that turned my theological world upside down. That God was not punishing us with death. That death is the natural consequences of us no longer participating in the divine life. And it's through the incarnation that we are able, it's at the incarnation, according to Athanasius, that life is woven back into humanity, all of humanity. And it's through then looking at Cyril of Jerusalem, who we will talk about next week in more detail, it's through the sacraments that we participate in the divine life. And the image of God that's been damaged in us, according to Thomas Ratray with his reading of Athanasius, is the indwelling Holy Spirit transforming us and remaking us into the image of Christ. So the Scots are really under a lot of pressure. They're not able to do as much work as they might have been able to do uh, because of the economic pressures upon them, but their English counterparts were able to do more work. They started publishing early church text, especially collections of Eucharistic liturgies. And Thomas Ratray was able to use those collections to do his comparative work. Joseph Mead, another English non-juror, makes the argument, now, if we think about it, for the Roman Catholics, the words that are the important words in the Eucharistic prayer is the repetition of the words of Christ. You know, this is my body, this is my blood in the Eucharistic prayer. That's not the words that are highlighted in our liturgy. When you look at what words are in all caps to point out that these are the really important words, it's the words that the people say in response to the priest praying the Eucharistic prayer on our behalf, catching us up into this divine drama, the retelling of the story. It's us saying amen, the Eucharistic sacrifice is the entire service of the gathered church. It's not just the epiclesis, 
It's not just the words of institution. It's all of us being there together and saying amen together. And there's this um, understanding that the early and medieval church understood that because of the incarnation, because of the way that we're made, because of the way that we've been damaged by the fall, that sacraments must have both a physical and spiritual component. Word and material are important in the ritual. We need to have, our senses need to, to participate in, uh, in the liturgy. It's one of the reasons why liturgy over the internet is so hard. Not only is it all the technical issues that we're dealing with, with delays and lags and the internet not cooperating with us when right when it should. We're made to be together. And it, I ache not being able to be present with you all and present with my home church during this time. So thinking about these three problems that Thomas Rat Ray is in the middle of, He ends up coming, realizing that um, the church is instituted by Christ at the Last Supper, realized on the cross and continues through his ascension. And I meant to have this come up as separate little bullets, so sorry, you've got all of this slide at one time. What happened was when Thomas Ratray was elected as a bishop, he was elected by the people and the clergy of the diocese. And the college of bishops would not seat him. They had someone else. They had a non-usager that they wanted as the bishop of that diocese. And so this, this other bishop was seated and then served for a couple of years. And when he died, the clergy and the people elected Thomas Ratray again as their bishop. And the, the College of Usagers or College of Bishops, the non-usagers would not seat him. So there was a set, two consecrations, a consecration of Thomas Ratray by some usager bishops and consecration of the other guy. So there's a Presbyterian who makes the argument that Thomas Ratray's consecration as a bishop was not valid. He actually makes the argument that all of the bishops need to agree, including, including the, uh, the Bishop of Rome. Like, yeah, that's going to happen. <laughs> so it causes Thomas Ratray to, to respond in writing. And as he's working on that, he starts going back. He looks at what Cyprian wrote about the early church and realized that the way that the church had always elected their bishops until Christendom was the people, the laity and the, uh, the clergy together elected the bishop and the other bishops agreed and you needed to have three bishops to consecrate that bishop. And that's, that's been the, the rule of the church since uh, early in the fourth century, since uh, 325, that you need three bishops to consecrate into this college of bishops. So what was going on before Christendom? Well, Wait a minute, if the church is instituted by Christ at the Last Supper, and is continuing, what if Christ gave the apostles the authority to consecrate? Bishops are the heirs of the apostles. We don't need a king to seat any of us. That's what the, Thomas is saying, Thomas Ratray is saying. When Christ instituted the church and the Holy Spirit descended in power, 
we, the church was given all that she needs to continue. This argument that Christ instituted the church at the Last Supper is that for Christ to offer himself, he can't offer himself on the, Christ, on the cross. That, that would be a weird form of something. But he tells his disciples what's going to happen. He consecrates his body to be a sacrificial meal for the church, for the ongoing, uh, the continuation of the church, and then allows himself to be crucified so that he can become a sacrifice. And it's not, it doesn't stop at the cross because if it, if it ended there, it, it dies right then. But because of his ascension, his resurrection, and his ascension and his continuing to offer himself as sacrifice on behalf of his church. The Eucharist is what makes the church. It's not the church makes Eucharist. So we don't need to be established by a government in order to continue as church. So if the, if the Eucharist is a sacrifice, which is what the usage is, usage or issue is about, then that takes care of this establishment. But now we've got this problem of two kinds of bishops or this temporary solution the Scots have put in place of these bishops without a diocese. Well, what it means to be human, part of what it means to be human, according to Thomas Ratray, is to be a people in a place given jurisdiction over creation, to have dominion over creation, to steward creation. If we're not doing that, we're not being who we are in creation. A king who has no kingdom is no king at all. That's me putting words into Thomas Ratray's mouth. Um, but the king doesn't have jurisdiction because he's not in the country, in country. Bishops without a diocese are not able to exercise the role that the church has given them of governing that group of people. The uh, What it means to be church is the church is the people and clergy gathered around the diocesan bishop at the altar, at Eucharist. What's happening in our, in a diocese is our bishops visiting different, you know, our, our bishop goes each week to different uh, parishes. We're all connected through the priest's obedience and the deacon's obedience to the bishop, the unity of the, pre the clergy with the bishop, the unity of the bishops in a nation are all signifying the unity of the church. There's not a king in here. So some big ideas from Thomas Ratray, and I'm going to end a little bit earlier today so that we have some time to talk. Thomas Ratray has made the argument that the Eucharist as sacrifice is the very lifeblood of the church. The local church is clergy and lady gathered around the diocesan bishop. They're the ones who elect the bishop I need to tell you a little bit more about Thomas Ratray. Not only was he finally seated as a bishop, he was elected as the primus, the next primus of Scotland. They went for the years of almost like a commonwealth, like what was happening without the king in England, is that this, after 
Bishop Rose died, the College of Bishops governed the Scottish Episcopal Church. They were finally able to make the argument, the usagers were able to make the argument that we, we really do need to have governance by a bishop at a place at Edinburgh. And they elected Thomas Ratray as the next Primus of Scotland. And sadly, the clergy of, um, of Edinburgh were not ready to accept him. So he had to wait. So they had a bishop elect for a really long time. Finally, they said, okay, we're, re we're ready. He wrote up several canons for the Scottish Episcopal Church to present to the, uh, the clergy and to the other bishops with the first council they were, or the first um, convention they were going to have. And sadly, he became sick and died and was not able to exercise his role as primus for very long at all. But they accepted all of the canons, including that the, uh, the election of the bishop was by the people, representatives of the people and the clergy. And that's also what Samuel Seabury brought over. It wasn't just the Eucharistic liturgy, it's aspects of the, the governance of the church that he brought over. Other big ideas. Thomas Ratway was arguing against Presbyterians. Presbyterians have a, a theology that's based in God's covenants. So he uses this same idea of entering into covenant with God. And the sacraments are the instituted by Christ means for participating in God's grace. God can do what God's gonna do. There are many ways that we participate in, in God's grace, but these are ones that have been given to us by Christ, especially baptism and Eucharist, um, as ways of incorporating us into the church. The covenantal sacraments convey the benefits that the symbol represents. Here's this connection between the material and the spiritual. With baptism, we have the washing away of sins, the idea of dying and rising, born to new life. Thomas Ratray is one of the ones who makes the argument that, um, that we also continue that baptism regenerates us. It transforms us. The divine image is re-implanted in us. The Holy Spirit indwells us and we're incorporated into the body of Christ which is the church, and we're able to participate in the divine life of the Trinity. Eucharist, bread and wine, the simplest elements of an ancient meal. Um, yeah, wine, you know, kind of looks like blood. Bread kind of looks like flesh. Got to worry about that a little bit with uh, uh, how pale that bread is. But anyway, it, it seems like bread to us. We're participating in Christ's body and blood shed on our behalf for our transformation. And through these sacraments, we're brought into union with God and transformed through our contemplation of God. There's a little bit of Athanasius again, our contemplation of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in us, making us to be the body of Christ. And for the Eucharist to be divinizing, this is where the rubber really hit the road for Thomas Ratray, is that for the Eucharist to be divinizing, for the covenant, covenantal actions to be made, God has promised to meet us in the sacraments, but that means that we need to pay attention to our side of the, of the covenant. 
there needs to be an authorized representative God offering, participating in these, this imitation of Christ continually offering his sacrifice to the Father. And so as our, this is, as our priest are elevating, you know, one way to think about this is our priests are elevating the bread and the wine look past our priest. Our priest is a, an icon of Jesus offering himself to the Father, catching us up in that offering, because we've already laid out the oblations, which are symbols of our life and labor. That's been brought forward as the offering, and that's what our priest is lifting up and as our priests are lifting up the bread and the wine, they're lifting up all that we bring with us as we come together to the table. So if we're not, there, that's the apostolic succession for us is we need our, our priest need to be properly ordained by those who have authority to consecrate. Our bishops are those who we understand as the authoritative representatives of God who are continuing doing what they're continuing in the teaching and the fellowship of the apostles. They're continuing to teach us the faith passing on what we have, what we have uh, inherited from the early church down through the ages. So I should say that part of this is, um, this is an excerpt from a current work that um, Several of us in the diocese have been working on a Eucharist shaped life. We're hoping it'll be published next year. And this is my first time getting to present my research. Very grateful for this opportunity. What do you think? Is this, is this livable? Does this help explain what we do as Episcopalians? Yes, Tony. Yeah. Um, probably being the newest Episcopalian in this classroom, I will say it does for me. It's uh, um, understanding, but, but I would like to ask you to define, in the middle of this, you talked about the Anglican middle way via media. Mm -hmm. Maybe everything you talked about described that, but could you put that in two or three sentences, or is that not yes. possible? Yes, I should have brought that forward. Um, good question. The Via Media, Elizabeth tried to find a middle way. So remember Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth comes after Mary. Yes. Um, yeah. And so we have, so let's, let's go back a little bit further. We have Henry, yep. who separates the, England from from Rome, but we don't really have a prayer book yet. It's under his son, Edward, that we have our first prayer book from Thomas Cramner. Then we have the um, two prayer books under Edward, where we've gone from what some would say a more Catholic understanding, uh, some would say too Roman, some would say it's the ancient church that we're, we're pulling forward. Um, so there's a Protestant Catholic argument going on there. You see that when Mary, when, when Edward dies, Mary becomes the next queen or becomes the queen of England. She takes the church back to Rome and it's Roman Catholic. When Elizabeth comes in, she, when Elizabeth, after Mary dies, Elizabeth is, uh, crowned queen. She's got a nation in turmoil. She decides that the, the better part of valor, valor is to find a middle way between 
the Roman way and the Continental Reformers way, what if we wrote the prayer book in a way where it could be interpreted a little more Catholic, a little more Protestant? Would that end up bringing the nation together so that we're not pulled apart? So she's trying to shoot the middle between the Continental Reformers and the Roman Catholics. Does that help a little bit? It, it, it does. I was hoping you'd um, kind of, I mean, the usages and the colleges, I, I don't know if those are the right two. Those are the right terms. Um, um, so the usagers, I'm sorry, I should let you finish your question. Substantiation. Um, I'm a Catholic for 50 years and yeah. you know, I got the transubstantiation class in fourth grade. And, um, and then I went to some more evangelical churches for a while. And I'm, just, and I'm an engineer. So mm -hmm. put everything in a box, I'd appreciate it. Just, no, I'm, I'm only joking, but yes, yes. So your, your discussion has really uh, helped me a lot to understand the nuanced differences and the progression of the themes and the issues here. So I'm, uh, I was just hoping for a little more definition, but maybe I'll- So I, I think that, so the usagers and non-usagers are a continuation of, it, it appears at the time to be, are we Puritan? Are we Presbyterian? You know, are we more Presbyterian? Are we more evangelical? The Eucharist is a, a, as a remembering, or are we more Catholic? transubstantiation. So Elizabeth tries to find a way where you can end up reading the text either way. What the Scots do, I think, is this amazing challenge to the middle way and say, wait a minute, what if both of those are wrong? What if there's a third way that incorporates some of this earlier church stuff that is... Um, it's not about remembering, merely remembering. It's not about the bread and the wine being transformed. It's about us being transformed. Got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And you did You're welcome. It. Good question. Thank you. So we are almost at time. Does anybody have a final question? All right, well, so I certainly appreciate this was, as, as Tony mentioned, tremendously helpful. I had, I had, I, I grew up as a Presbyterian, and so I had actually had no context of any of this even, so as part of this too. So um, I came from the other extreme of Tony. Um, uh, so thank you so much for everything that you did, um, and we are looking forward to next week, so. Thank you very much. I look forward to being back with you next week. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Take care.